It was late December 2001 when Cliff Allison and his wife Mabel met me at the train station in Kirby Stephen in Cumbria. Through the years I had met Cliff at the Silverstone race circuit many times. My longtime friend Merv Tirio introduced me to Cliff. When Cliff and Mabel invited me to visit them in their home, I gladly accepted their kind invitation. To begin my visit, Cliff took me on a tour of the local area. We began by visiting Bruff Castle. This stone castle was built on the site of an ancient Roman fort. It was one of a chain of forts guarding the road from York over the Pennines to Carlisle. Since the castle is on a steep slope, it was well positioned to be a strong defense against the constant danger of attack from the Scottish kings during the early 12th century. Mabel was my tour guide and explains. 1,100, a stone castle was built. So you see it's nearly, it's a thousand years old, isn't it? Right. Almost. But the thickness of these walls. Through the many decades, the castle was modified and or rebuilt. Its use also continually changed. In 1174, William the Lion, King of Scotland, captured the town of Bruff and set it afire. As was often the case, old castles and buildings fell into ruins. Some of the stonework was carried away by the locals to build their own new buildings. As we look over the town of Bruff, we can only imagine which of these buildings contain stones from Bruff Castle. A short drive through Bruff reveals a few of the charming handmade articles which stand amongst the enduring stone buildings. Do you want me to just carry on? Sure, just carry through. We then proceed along the winding roads to stop for a pint of the local ale. On the way, we passed through farmland where a few years earlier, cattle in the area suffered from bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. The disease caused great hardship for the farmers and the local economy. It also caused great concern worldwide. We arrive at the Tan Hill Inn for our pint. This building dates back to the 17th century. Originally, its use was as a hostelry for coal miners. Even though it is very remote, it has remained popular as a pub. And this is the highest hill around the area? It's the highest pu public house in England. The Tan Hill Inn is 11 miles from the nearest town and is accessible only by a one-lane twisting road. Yet, the pub is constantly busy. This pub has a reputation for being the faulty towers of North Yorkshire. In the very cold weather, sheep sometimes come indoors. The staff keeps a mop on hand for when the call goes up, lambs skitter on the floor. Stayed more, and my. Sunday treat was riding the horse from uh, Banksgate to here, and putting it in the stable, which is now your other room. Yeah, just there. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, have my lunch, and then ride it back again in the afternoon. <laughs> the landlady here has a reputation for being sharp tongued. Although she is kind hearted and means no harm, she has been called the rudest woman in Britain. Of course, Tan Hill is haunted, which of course adds to its mystique. Our tour continues. And this area is known as Cumbria. This is Cumbria, yes. That the road goes under the thing isn't isn't square, you know, oh. and, and everything was all shaped to the the correct angle, you know, which yes. was. For the slopes really, you're talking about craftsmanship. Huh? Yeah. What an experience! 
What fun to be driven along winding roads by an ex-Lotus race driver, by an ex-Ferrari race driver. Cliff Allison loved the Nürburgring circuit where he drove very well. Cliff said much of the circuit was similar to the roads around the Lake District close to his home in Bruff and Kirby Stephen. We soon arrived where Cliff spent his very early life. When I was uh, just a little nipper, about uh, six months old, yeah. I wasn't actually born in that house. I was born in a house just up here. But that's the house where I lived until I was, uh, till I, until 1943, till I went up to Billingsgate. You lived in there until you got married? Uh, from 1943 until 1952. Not far away is where Cliff and his father had their business operations. What's the business called? Uh, Grand, Prix, Grand Prix Services. Yeah. Well, it, it, that'll tell you all about it on there if you photograph that. So has it got anything to do with Grand Prix? No, just because my father said, well, I was a Grand Prix driver, I ought to have Grand Prix on the title of the business, that's all. Which are, it's Frank Allison Limited. As we can see, Cliff and his father offered a great many services, including this building where he opened a nightclub. Yeah. And I uh, converted that into a nightclub. Oh, really? So uh, the, top, the top area of that is a nightclub now. To end the tour, we stop to see a view of the Bruff Castle and its proximity to the village below. Looks as if it's growing out of the top of that house. <laughs> 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 There's many who take that photo home, they'll say, you've just stuck that on. <laughs> we return to Cliff and Mabel's residence, which is named Keel Mara. Cliff was eager to show me his fish pond of koi carp. Cliff was proud of his 23 Japanese koi carp, which he has selected for their color and patterns. Collecting and raising koi carp has a long tradition close to 200 years. It is a very relaxing hobby, quite the contrast to motor racing. Mabel and Cliff invited me in for a traditional beef dinner. What a perfect meal following our tour of Cumbria and preceding a fascinating evening learning about Cliff's racing career. Cliff has an amazing archive of books, pictures, memorabilia, and trophies. He showed us pictures of his early days of racing, including his victories in his new Formula 500 Cooper. In those early years, he raced against drivers such as Sterling Moss, and often claimed victory. That's that horrible picture. Yes, that, that's that horrible one I was telling you about. No, <laughs> oh, Dundrod. Now, Dundrod. What's, what has Dundrod. happened Dundrod. there? Well, that's me driving the Mark, Na Mark 9. That was. And yeah. that's uh, Ken Smith underneath an Elva. And right. that's him. That's his arm there. Oh, good grief. <laughs> and that's where he was killed. Yeah. Wow. Because Cliff was doing well as a race car driver, Colin Chapman, head of Lotus, signed Cliff to the Lotus team and to drive the new Lotus 12. In July 2001, Motorsport magazine published an article regarding Cliff's time as a works Lotus driver. I'm not too sure which car it was, whether it was a car that I'd driven or not, but uh, it was one of the uh, Lotus cars. They, they did mention it being Graham Hill's car, but... Uh, I, I, I would most likely drive the car at some time during its uh, life because we used to swap cars. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, oh, it's quite nice. Not sure is it. Oh, no, yeah. that's the one with Merv there. <laughs> oh. The yeah. Merv's second to the left, isn't he? Yeah. That's Merv there. I wonder if he's seen that picture. I'm pretty sure he will have done because it's been in quite a lot of magazines. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he will have seen that. Tell me about this one. That's uh, driving the 12 at uh, Spa 
1958 in the uh, Belgian Grand Prix mm -hmm. and uh, I finished fourth Right. and uh, you can see by the attitude of the car and the fact that the wheel isn't on the ground that that car's going very quickly. <laughs> I love that photograph. Who were you racing against that day, Cliff? If the if the race had been another lap, I'd have I'd have won the race. Because, oh, that's the uh, one where Tony Brooks uh, had a right. gearbox problem. Yeah, okay. Mike Mike blew up on the line. Right. Uh, t Tony had uh, gearbox trouble, and uh, Louis Evans' suspension broke. Oh. And I was fourth. Salvadori was fifth, I think, and. Uh, Anyway, those sort of guys. But I loved that thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, the speed, it, it was absolutely... I, I, I used to love speed, you know. And, and that one's one where you take it to the limit and then it would lose? Very tricky to drive, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, Colin Chapman always used to say that if you couldn't control it, the car was quicker than the driver. Well, the, that... that um, that car was quite, it's not, not an easy car to drive, right. but a very quick car. Mm -hmm. It had very little frontal area and uh, cut through the air pretty well, you know. It tells you how fast I was going at Spa, I forget where it is. It's <laughs> Those are two boys, eh? Having a go. which uh, is pretty quick. That's down the... Uh, master straight, isn't it, they call it, I think, the mm -hmm. master. There's a little curve in the middle of it, but they call it a straight. At 100 and 180 miles an hour, it's a, it's a bend. That's... Uh, I don't know where... where I think it's, it looks like Monza, doesn't it? I haven't, I haven't really looked at it. Well, it's Cliff. Innes, Ireland and Graham Hill. This is before the Chantet Porto in Portugal. I think so. It doesn't look tattered there, does it? No, it looks very straight. Uh, that, w that was the... the we, we went down to uh, a Porto, went to the Porto Gris Grand Prix, and we took the car down on the back of a VW pickup, uh, Mike Costin and I, and we raced the car there. And uh, as, I, as I said before, I got onto the ball bearings and uh, left half the car on the bridge. That's at Nürburgring, right? That's at the carousel in 1958. And how did you do in that race? Well, there again, I um, I didn't prang it that time, but I um, went out of the race. I was lying third and uh, just behind Tony Brooks in the van wall and uh, the radiator burst, and it was a brand new car. As well as driving the open-wheel Lotus cars, Cliff drove Lotus sports racing cars. Your victory at Le Mans. That's at Le Mans in, the in 1957. Right. Tell me about that race. Well, that was, uh, there again, sports car racing, I found, was... Uh, not very interesting. But you were good at it. But, um, well, yes, but uh, you rely more on the equipment than you do on the driver. Yeah. I mean, the equipment has to get you through to the other end, doesn't it? That's right. Whereas in a Grand Prix, if it breaks, well, you were making the maximum use of it and uh, it's supposed to be able to stand maximum use. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, these cars, you knew that if you made maximum use of it, it wasn't going to last. That's right. In fact, particularly at Le Mans, the, uh, the first stretch of, a, of the, the race at Le Mans is usually uh, the first part of a Grand Prix. Right. Because you, you either ho hope that you're going to bend it in the first uh, stretch and then you can go to bed. 
Mm -hmm. Or if you're, <laughs> if you're leading at the end of that, then you've got to try and make a better job of it and nurse it through to the end. That's just after you won the uh, race in the, yeah. front of the index of performance, right? This Lotus 15 is where? Le Mans. That's at Le Mans? Yes. Are you driving it? I'm driving it there, yes. But Graham oh. and I were driving, you see. Right. But uh, the chap who owns the car now right. has had it all refurbished and he wants me to have a ride in it sometime. Cliff Allison's reputation for open-wheel cars and sports racing cars caught the attention of Enzo Ferrari. Cliff soon became a Ferrari works driver. Here we see Cliff seated in a Ferrari open-wheel car with the Ferrari team principals in attendance. Well, I, I can remember them. <laughs> There's Keaty on the Once left, Tavoni, Ferrari, and Cliff Allison is in the car. Right this is the back of that picture with Keaty, Tavoni, and Enzo. Here we see Cliff Allison with the Ferrari team manager, Romolo Tavoni, and Olivier Jean de Bien. Jean de Bien partnered Phil Hill in a Ferrari in 1960 to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Now this is in Monaco? In 19... That's in Monte Carlo in uh, 1959. In actual fact, I, I was driving a Formula 2 car, which, right. is, which is this car here. Yeah. And that's me sitting in the car. And uh -huh. Tony was in the lead uh, Formula One car, and uh, Jean Berra, the Frenchman, was, he was driving the other one, right. and uh, Phil Hill. So that was the full team. Oh. So you had three cars in the team at that time? They had three Formula One cars and a Formula Two car, and I was in the Formula Two car. How did you do in the race? Um, Von Tripp spun and in front of me and it was either run into him or um, and kill him or yeah. run into the wall so I ran into the wall and there were three Formula 2 cars in the race Bruce Alford was driving a Lotus and uh, Taffy Von Trips was driving a Porsche I was driving a Ferrari and we all went out in the same accident Cliff Allison and Phil Hill were teammates in Ferrari Formula 1 here they are seen before final practice in the 1960 Monte Carlo Grand Prix. Ferrari in 1960. Adino 246, right. two and a half litre. That was when I had my accident. Oh, this is during practice then? That was it? during practice, that was just before right. I had my accident. Then in the afternoon, when they, they, they came along and told us that there was something wrong with the timing. And so they would uh, they, they would discount all the times that we'd, that we'd done that morning. Right. And uh, I'd already given my uh, fastest practice tyres to fill. And so they'd put those on to fill. They'd filled my, my car up with full tanks and, uh, and um, changed it onto new tyres. And I was supposed to just go out and scrub the tyres. And of course, once I got going, I was going so well that I thought, well, I must, I might as well get a time under my belt. Right. And uh, the rest, you know. That's Cliff, right? That's Taffy at the same spot. <laughs> Actually retired. That that was in uh, Spa in a Lotus. Yeah. And that, and that really put paid to it because I'd broken about everything else. I thought, <laughs> I thought probably the next thing would be a neck, so I th right. just uh, decided to pack it in. Yeah. I'd, I'd, by that time, of course, I had a wife and family, and uh, yeah. you can see a little bit of where the road. That's that's the tunnels just up here. Yeah. You come you come out of the tunnel. Right. Yeah, I come over mean. the hill and then through this chicane and mm -hmm. on. And, and it, it, today the 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 the, uh, the road surface has to be so precise. You know they must have the right aggregate and all that sort of thing. Well, yeah. And uh, in those days, this was tarmac and mm -hmm. this was pavement. Yeah. You, you can you can see the pavement on there. Look. Right. And this was as slippery as anything. Gosh. So it was a an accident waiting to happen. Hmm. 
but we just used to get on and do it in those days. Now that's a photograph showing you just after your accident in practice at Monte Carlo and you're thrown through the air. Do you remember seeing that photograph? No. Because that's in Autosport. No, I don't remember seeing it. I'll have it in the, if it's in Autosport, I'll have it in, because uh, I have all the Autosport. Cliff was reluctant to discuss his accident, but he kindly autographed my photograph. It is amazing to me that these three photos were taken of Cliff within seconds of his being airborne. Notice the lack of safety features of the track, such a stark difference to our current regulations. Cliff Allison's Formula One career has not been forgotten. Many years after he retired, a gathering of old Ferrari drivers was featured at the Essen Motor Show. The Ger German Motor Show was at Essen, and yes. uh, they did a special uh, exhibition of uh, Ferrari, mm -hmm. and they invited uh, a lot of old Ferrari drivers over to uh, commemorate the occasion, and right. fortunately I was invited. And that's you in the top left, right? That's me at the top left. and Next then to Derek uh, Bell. Derek Bell, Tony Brooks, Tony Brooks, Innes Island, and um, Roy Salvadori, Villa Racy, and uh, Phil Hill. Phil Hill. Um, I think this guy, I forget who's Tambe, is it or something they call this guy? Tambe? This, this is Trantino, this is uh, Paul Frere. Paul Frere, right. Chris Amon. And then John Surtees. John Surtees and Olivia Jeanneville. Cliff Allison also drove Ferrari sports racing cars with great success, especially the three-liter Testarossa. So this is the first Testarossa you drove? Yes, and Dan, Dan and I joined Ferrari at the same time. When I won that cup up there, um, that's the uh, first... Ferrari that I ever drove in competition at uh, 12 hours at Sebring right. in 1959 and uh, with Jean Berra and that's the trophy that I won in the middle there. In uh, Buenos Aires. Tell me about that race, Cliff. Well, the, the thing I remember most about that race actually, uh, as with most uh, sports car races, uh, they're, they're a bit dull, you know. They're not very interesting on sports car races. But uh, the thing I do remember was Dan was driving a three-litre birdcage, Maserati. Yeah. And uh, he and I, being friends, were uh, rivals, you know, as well as friends. And uh, we had a jolly good uh, dash. Right. And part of the uh, track that they use for this race is down a dual carriageway, right, and uh, then you go up the slip road, mm -hmm. across the top of the dual carriageway, and down the other slip road, back onto it, oh. and then you rejoin the Grand Prix circuit and go mm -hmm. around that, yeah, and then back out onto the dual carriageway oh, really? and so on, you know. And so I, re I remember, and, and Dan does too, because we always have a laugh about it, and we were going further and further up this ramp. Yeah. And breaking later and later and later until eventually he overdid it and shot down the other side of the slip road. And I never saw him again after that. <laughs> oh, really? So it was, but it was one of those inter interesting little episodes. So with this car, you partnered Phil Hill. That's right. And you went on to, vic to victory there, didn't That's you? That's right. We won that race, yes. What was that car like to drive? Beautiful. I was very fortunate to be driving for Ferrari when they had two really good cars, in my opinion. That was the uh, the 3 litre Tessarossa and the 246 Dino, right. I think, were superb motor cars. Mm -hmm. In Cliff and Mabel's living room are many paintings and trophies on display, including this cup and these three Ferrari flags. One is autographed. There's four world champion drivers 
autographs on this flag. Oh, Fangio yeah. and Reddy Phil Hill. And Reddy Phil Hill Surtees. John Surtees. Oh, John Surtees. After Cliff had recovered from his Monte Carlo accident, he drove for the Centro Sud team. In Porto? In Porto, yes. And you are driving... I don't, I don't think the background is very authentic, but, well, I drove a, a Centro Sud uh, 250F Maserati. Commendatory day, they called the chap who owned the Scuderia Centro Sud. Hmm. He was an Italian guy, but uh, I think there was some American people involved in it as well, and that, that hence the colour of the car. However, before too long, Cliff Allison gave up racing, fearing his next accident would cause a broken neck. He did remain connected to the sport. As a true gentleman, he welcomed his fans and enjoyed being reunited with his past teammates and the cars which he so competently drove. In this photograph, we see the 1960 Argentine-winning Ferrari 3-liter Testarossa with Phil Hill and Cliff Allison, all joyfully reunited. Through the years, I met up with Cliff during several British Grand Prix events at Silverstone. It was my privilege that he was so friendly and unassuming. Later, he sent me two photographs and this letter which I shall read. Dear Shane, I had these copied for you, as promised, ages ago, and forgot where I had put them. Anyway, here they are. Hope you and Colleen are well. I saw Merv at Silverstone this year, and I had a super time at Monte Carlo as we were guests at the ACMC on the 40th anniversary of our club. We were there two weeks as the Grand Prix was preceded by the historic meeting, which happens every two years. Kind regards, yours sincerely, Cliff. Here are the two color photographs which Cliff enclosed in the letter to me. He very kindly autographed them. In my great anticipation of visiting with Cliff, I took several of my old Autosport magazines for him to autograph, and he most kindly obliged. Later I met Phil Hill at Laguna Seca and had him autograph the same picture. Cliff also autographed pictures in the Autosport high-performance cars of 1957 to 1958. Cliff's photographs, his letter, and the many autographs are a treasured addition to my archive. For a full history of Cliff Allison, please refer to Graham Gold's official biography. Cliff Allison is probably best known for his racing career, but he was much more than that. He had his garage business, he had his family, he had his Koei Carp, and he also loved caravanning with family and friends. It was just after setting out in his caravan with Mabel that he suffered a heart attack and died at the wheel. That was in April of 2005. He was 73 years old. The world lost a very great friend. 